Let's get into it, Soul Not For Sale podcast. What I got for you guys today, you already saw the title when you clicked. This is a wrap up of the JRE week. We got Chris Rufio. I got clips from each one of the podcasts that was on this week. We're gonna discuss the podcast and I'm gonna let you know basically if it's worth your time. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of the podcast as well. We got Chris Rufo that was on at the beginning of the week, then Zach Schneider, then Riley Gaines, then Kevin James. So all the podcasts were great, but I'm gonna be showing you clips. I got four, five, six clips for you guys. Uh, four from the podcast, from the JRE, from each one of the uh, guests that were on, and then two, one from Chris Rufo, and then one from Riley Gaines. Riley Gaines testifying in front of con uh, Congress, which is absolutely ridiculous for the stand that she took to have a 22, 23 year old girl have to stand in front of Congress and and explain to these adults why Leia Thomas's presence was upsetting for young girls in dressing rooms. It's just so wild to me, it makes no sense, but she actually straightens out this Congresswoman in the best way possible. And then I have a clip of Chris Rufo actually having a discussion with Coleman Hughes, very intellectual discussion, but he's breaking down the similarities between an organization that used to exist in the 70s and BLM, and I, I just, it's just so much information from this guy, I'm telling you. But let's just get right into it. We got no ads today. Let's just jump right in. Chris Rufo's episode, and let's talk about it. Go off at any time. The 2020 was a wake-up call for many people. The next wake-up call is going to be 2020 100 times over. Um, and so those of us and those people who are just arranging their personal lives that are listening should be figuring out what they what to do how to best position themselves to be successful for their families for their careers for whatever they're working on and those of us who want to see deeper changes you know we're all preparing we're all getting ready to say when the house of cards falls over and it's revealed that none of this is sustainable the fundamentals of our country institutional financial political cannot hold and they can't be covered over with ideology for anymore um you know we have to have responsible civic-minded people that are ready to take leadership again um, and I think that um, it may not be this election cycle, it may not be in a year, it may not be in two years, but by any vector, if you talk to people who really know, we're heading towards a big shift. Uh, and I hope that we can emerge on the other side, just freeing ourselves from a lot of this ideological capture that I think is hurting people uh, and hurting our country. I could agree more. And just leave people the fuck alone and, and stop using this as a vector of control because that's what they're doing. And it's also... Th there's a problem with that, though. The ideology, leave me alone, the kind of philosophical statement, is correct. I, I believe in it. It's a kind of civic, Republican ideal. It's spending the American way is give people the maximum autonomy to their lives, delegate to civil society as much as you can. But we don't live in that world anymore. We have a, a, a massive federal bureaucracy. We have these huge institutions that control the culture. Um, and so uh, I if you're arguing to be left alone, you're always going to be run over by people who don't want to leave you alone. The solution is not to then, you know, assume it and impose your vision, but you at least have to have people who, who are willing to fight the public fight. Um, because, you know, most people want to be left alone. They deserve that. But we need to have a leadership class, a kind of counter elite capable of taking over these institutions that can then adopt the, the policies and, and administer the centralized institutions to protect the average person. The average person is not going to read uh, queer theory and, and, and understand what's happening and fight, fight the good fight. But people who are involved in political life, I think we have a duty to provide protection for the average person. The average person is calling for physical protection, uh, protection of their livelihood, protection of their reputation, protection of their kids, protection of their institutions. Um, do you see anyone that is uh, directly speaking to that need and offering a, a plausible vision for how that could be accomplished? I, I think very few people are thinking in those terms, and, and to me that's a shame. Man. This was an interesting episode. I learned a lot from this. I was uh, I looked into his documentary. I talked about it on an episode I recently just did. He has a documentary called America Lost. And apparently that was the that was the documentary that he did that triggered his mind because this gentleman, you can hear him now. He's talking about ideological uh, ide I You know what I'm trying to say? Ideological trap uh, capture. He's talking about he's talking about you know, basically the woke mob, you know, taking over all these institutions. And this documentary actually triggered him from being a far left, grew up in a family that was a bunch of communists, 
they really delved into Marxist ideology in his family. And this documentary that he did triggered his mind and made him see that, you know, these 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 policies that are put in place are actually holding down the middle and lower class more than you can imagine. And it's a wild documentary. Um, it's re it's really hard to watch because it's your fellow man and it's just so much imagery and stories about how hard so many people have it. Um, and you know, for me, I'm, I'm sure for you, unless you're like some person sitting in an ivory tower right now, you like, you feel it, you feel how hard it is. You feel how, you know, how, how tight everything's becoming, whether it's tight economically or, or tight with, with what you can say. And now it's touching onto what you can think. It's just, and now there's cancellation and, and, and people want to almost, it's, it's like they want to digitally burn you at the stake. And it doesn't matter whether you're a famous person or you're just somebody who's just a regular guy. They'll take away your, your ad revenue. They'll, they'll, they'll take, take away your job. They'll make it so you can't get another job. It's, it's, it's getting so crazy, but his mission has become coming from the rights coming from so far left his mission has become to stomp out all of this stuff that you see going on uh, on in the woke mob and he's not doing it through emotion he's doing it through actual policy he's he's trying to get into places of the government and actually introduce some common sense so this episode is absolutely amazing i would i would suggest anybody listen to this back back to front front to back I, uh, I have listened to it twice already. Um, I'm going to try and uh, interview this gentleman. If you if, if if you have him on any social medias, be like, hey, you should interview. If you're on X, be like, hey, you should do an interview with Coach Colin. Say that to him. Please, please. It helps tremendously. I'm going to show you another clip from this gentleman, him and uh, Coleman Hughes sitting down to have a conversation. This is very, very interesting to me. Um, here, let's just play this real quick. Listen to Listen to this. Nothing new under the sun. Um, at, in the wake of some of those policy changes, and at, le at the very least, many of those cultural changes. And so this is a pattern that we see over and over. And in fact, there's an analog in the, in the, in the 1970s that I document in the book where the Black Liberation Army, um, you know, which was a kind of prototype of the Black Lives Matter movement, adopted the same kind of rhetoric, the same kind of strategies, uh, the same insistence on 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 prison abolition, prison breaks, um, you know, community policing, ejecting the f police from from uh, uh, you know low income black communities uh, in New York City and other places. Um, and they said in their literature, the Black Panther Party, which was the kind of original organization from which the BLA splintered, they said the number one recruiting mechanism for us is to cause conflicts with the police highlight incidents and, and in some case manufacture incidents mm -hmm. of police brutality and then bring in people who are already predisposed towards violence and indoctrinate them with our left-wing politics. They, they said this very clearly in interviews and pamphlets, etc. And what they started doing as they got more desperate in the mid-1970s was actually just assassinating police officers in, in New York, in Georgia, in other cities. They would find a police officer on the side of the road, you know, sitting in the cruiser and, you know, run up to their window and at point blank range, uh, execute them. And they would do things like, um, in, in one instance, a grisly incident in New York City, they executed the police officer, shot them in the head, and then did a war dance over the corpse before fleeing. And what they discovered, you know, as, as we could, you know, imagine is that this actually alienated the very people on whose behalf they claim to be fighting. Um, and so they found that these, these communities where they said, we are going to displace the police and we will become the law. Um, but actually they became the mafia. They were robbing, stealing, shaking down, holding hostages, you know, uh, you know ruling through violence. Um, they were rejected by the very community that they claimed to represent. And so this dynamic, this process we saw in really dramatic scale in the 1970s and then in, uh, you know, in a relatively smaller scale in some ways, uh, or rather less dramatic, maybe not smaller, but at certainly less dramatic scale in 2020. Okay, so zooming out. Very, very, very interesting stuff. This interview is uh, on Coleman Hughes' channel. 
Uh, I didn't even know he had a channel. You should check it out. It just It's just his name, Coleman Hughes. He has a full conversation. It's called The Rise of the Radical Left with Chris Rufo. Very interesting conversation. And he's a well of knowledge. That's the thing. Throughout, I wish... I wish they, I don't want to say Joe should have dug deeper because there's nothing to dig. You're having a free th- uh, flowing conversation and you're trying to put the spotlight on someone that deserves it. That's all that Joe's trying to do when he has these type of shows. But there's so much more that this guy has access to in his mind. I When I first saw him, I compared him to like a young Jordan Peterson. Some people in the comments after I posted the episode that I did recently um talking about how he left the woke mob they actually compared him to a young thomas sowell which is an incredible compliment as well i mean there's a lot of these guys jordan peterson was heavily into socialism when he was younger he learned his lesson as he got older thomas sowell apparently thank you to the comment section for letting me know but thomas sowell himself was quite the marxist uh when it came down to it when he was younger and he came to his senses as well I mean, even someone like me was kind of left-leaning before when I was younger. And, you know, you get a wife and some kids or a wife and kid. And then all of a sudden you you kind of come to your senses. I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting to see over and over and over again in different people. But definitely go check this episode out. It is definitely worth sitting back and listening to. A little bit hard if you're, you're like the way I used to watch this podcast. If you're in a warehouse on a forklift, kind of hard to take in all the concepts that Chris is talking about. But, you know, just listen to it again, man. I'm telling you, I'm not getting paid by Joe Rogan by saying this. I'm telling you. Um, Let's get into the next. The next one is Zach Schneider. Quote, the Spartans 300 was, and I quote, this is what he said. 300 was the gayest movie ever made. Oh, gosh. Let's get into it. Because they like, and also the Hellots were fine. If the Hellots killed them, that was fine because that meant they, that they weren't good enough anyway. And then they would have this like, they did this ritual with this like table of cheese where like all these Spartan warriors would stand around the table and all the 13 year olds who were ready to like transition to becoming true Spartans, you'd have to like try and get and pull a piece of cheese off this stone table. And the, and the Spartan warriors who guarded the table could do anything to stop you. Oh, and it was God. just like, just beating the crap out of these 13 year olds. And, they, and finally, like, you know, if you got it, then you were, you were given to a, a Spartan soldier who raised you. And basically the idea was that you, he was your lover, he was your teacher, he was everything to you. Because the Spartans believed that, you know, really they believed that you, you, you would die for your, your brother if you were also lovers. You know, they, right. thought, they thought that like, if you were confused about why we're fighting, fight for that guy, who's not right. only your best buddy, but like, uh, there's like a story, I guess, where they were like, the Spart- when the Persians first came, they sent a scout over and, the- and they looked down at the Spartans right the night before the big battle. And he goes, he went back and he goes, they were all like having sex with each other. It was like a weird, like, <laughs> we're, we're like, it's, we're, we're going to be good. And, the, and the, there was this, one of the Spartans kings was, the old Spartan king was now working with the Persians and said like, oh no, we're fucked. They're saying goodbye to each other. Do you know, like, do you know what that means? Like, we're completely screwed. Like, they're going <laughs> to... Like, we're going to get murdered tomorrow, you know? Like, and, and they were like, you're, you're nuts. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, they're a bunch of softies. Like, let's go get them. What if that's the key <laughs> to, the, to being the, the absolute greatest arm? You have to be gay. Yeah. I, you have to be gay. Well, I, there's precedent, so I don't know. There is precedent. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. Like, imagine if that was applied today. Yeah, it could be amazing. Yeah, but well, that would be a real problem. We'll see. We'll see. The family structure. <laughs> we'll see what they say. Yeah. Well, th- th- by the way, in the end, the Spartans had a real problem because they couldn't. We talk. There's this really crazy thing, like where on their wedding night, they would have to shave the head of your bride and dress her like a man, and she would fight you because there was no. That was the only way they got hard. That was the only way they could get it. Yeah, get aroused oh because like they needed God, like, like unless they got like unless they got like a bloody lip, you know, they were like not. It wasn't going to happen. Oh, that's yeah. so insane. Isn't that crazy? That's so insane. So like you can imagine that it was hard to like keep the you know, generate enough offspring, you know, right. with that, like you had an awesome army, right? They were fucking the best, but like you, you're as far as your procreation was going, it wasn't God awesome. imagine. man, that is hard to hear. That was one of my favorite movies. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. You know, Joe Rogan often talks about all of these interviews that he does giving him a very unlikely education. And that's, that's, that's what I just got with that holy and then at about two hours four minutes he starts talking about them again and that's when he's like he's like he's like arguably he's like 300 was the gayest movie ever made i was just like gosh geez (laughs) i did not know that i thought it was 
I thought it was rather manly. But I, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess I was right. Very interesting. But Zack Schneider, this episode, basically, they're just talking about movies. You know, Joe Rogan touches on the fact that he wanted to be a cartoonist when he was a kid. If you guys didn't know, that's what he wanted to do at one point. And, you know, they're just having movie talk. It's an all right episode. Like, I listened to it while I was working out. It's one of those episodes where you can tune in and out, and it's okay. They're not talking about anything too important. They're definitely not touching on any political stuff. They're not talking about Trump or Biden or the election or immigration or, you know, transgender rights. They're not talking about any of that. LGBTQ, they're not touching on anything that's controversial. They're just having a nice, easy conversation. Worth listening to, but definitely if you missed it, that's okay too. I'll I'll just say that. Let's move on. The next one we're going to is Kevin James because Riley has the greatest clip at the end when she's at con- in congress so i want to i want to save the best for last let's move on to kevin james let's go we, get really we, into things we, we started jujitsu did, did we start at the same time yeah basically it, the same be, time. beverly yeah. hills jujitsu right yeah. like you were the one who brought me down there yeah i'm a blue belt <laughs> and and barely 30 it's like yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Do you know what i'm saying it's like because i start stop i don't right. think you know what i'm saying and that's in my head i'm like ah oh, if i would have done what joe did man look where i could have been and i you know i'm, I'm trying to you know why do, and then I start comparing. Like, right, you can do it now. You do that. And I, if if I play that game, I'm done because I can never catch up to yeah. other people. Well, a lot of it's like learned behavior patterns. You just have you get stuck in. And if you're unlucky, you can get a bad behavior pattern of constantly quitting things. Right. But if you're lucky, you can. Look, I got very lucky that when I was 15, I got obsessed with martial arts. Right. Because that was the first thing I ever did in my life where I didn't think I was a loser anymore. I was like, I realized that if you work really hard at something and you're completely obsessed with something, it could transform your life. So my my life from the time I was 15 to the time I was 18, I was a different human. Mm -hmm. From 14, 15, I was insecure. I get bad social anxiety. We moved around a lot. I get picked on a lot. And I went from that to being completely confident mm-hmm. like being yeah. just a different human being i was fighting all the time it wasn't like to me the uh, the fear of like conflict was pretty g- much gone because i was just engaging in conflict all over the country i was flying around my whole high school all my time so i got in my head that the way to feel better and to get life to improve is to just fucking dig in mm-hmm. and keep going and don't ever quit. Don't fucking quit. That's so great. But I got lucky that that's something that I fell into when I was 15. I often think about, you know, there was one day, dude, one day when I was coming home from a baseball game where I walked up the stairs. We were getting ready to ride the T, which is like the Boston mm-hmm. subway, subway system. And we were getting ready to ride the T, but the line after the, the baseball game was like really long. There were so many people that were on the T. So we, just for a goof, walked up the stairs to see this Taekwondo school. And as we were walking up the stairs, this guy, John Lee, who was a national champion at the time, was preparing for the World Cup. And he was like 28 years old. He was in his prime. And he was kicking this bag. And as I was going up the stairs, I was hearing, whoomp! And then the sound of a chain, like, shink, whoomp, shink. And I went up and watched this guy kick the bag. And I was like, like what the tongue, fuck tongue is that? And yeah. Kick, what, what He's you? kicking the pole. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I was, I was just, I was like, I want to learn how to do that. Right. This episode, this episode is amazing because I didn't know how long Kevin and Joe have been friends. They've been friends for like 30 years. And this episode is just two two friends sitting down. Again, it's not getting too political. It's not getting too controversial. Nothing like that. And they're just talking. But the thing about this one is Kevin James opens up so much about his weight, why he keeps gaining weight, uh, his issue with like overeating. You know, he brought up starting things and not finishing them. You know, he brought up how he buys gym equipment because it gives him a little bit of hope every time he does. So his house is, you know, he has a level in his house that's just filled with gym equipment like like The Rock lives there. You know, that's like a direct quote from him. And it's very it's very inspiring how open he is about where he's at. And then Joe just has exactly what you're hearing. Joe's just having that motivational talk with him. So for me. I don't know about you, but when I was like working in factories and even still now, you know, because I'm not, you know, I still need motivation. I still need to hear good things. I still have imposter syndrome. You know, if you're somebody who's just like at work and you hate your job and you just, bro, listen to this episode. Listen to this episode while you're at work. It'll take a nice two hours and 28 minutes just straight off of your day. 
it's really, really good. They're just reminiscing, having a good time. Kevin James is just opening up. Joe Rogan's just trying to give him some motivation and inspire him. It's just an all-around good episode. Now, let's move on to Riley Gaines. You guys know Riley Gaines because you probably know Leia Thomas. And a, a, a direct story from the episode is that Riley Gaines had to race Leia Thomas. Riley Gaines is five foot five. Leia Thomas is six foot one and a half. And they go toe to toe. And by all measures of our mind, this man should just, or sorry, this person, this lady, Leia, this them lady should dominate Riley Gaines. Okay. And they tie. They tie exactly. But what ends up happening is because of the optics, they look at the white blonde girl who's straight and Christian. And they look at her and they say, you don't get to have a trophy. We only have one. And we're going to give it to Leia Thomas. So when you're posing for pictures, Leia's actually going to have it. And we'll, we'll probably mail you one eventually. So she gets shafted heavily. And this turns into a career as basically, she's basically an activist now. It's not what she wanted. It wasn't what she was looking for. She just wanted to swim. She's an incredible swimmer. But it turned into this whole career. So I'm just going to play a little bit of her trying to just uh, get through all of the backlash that she's receiving online. And then I'm going to show you a clip of her dealing with a congresswoman. I love the way she handled this. We have to learn how to just recognize like oh, that person. And honestly, like what I've realized, because again, like initially taking that first step, it was hard for me to read a lot of the things that were written. And like, because again, a very natural woman, I, I think thing, I think a, a, a pretty human thing. Like I don't. I don't want to ruffle feathers. I don't want to step on toes. I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, so it's hard for me to read a lot of what was being said about me online. But I realized pretty quickly, honestly, that the hate and, and the attacks that I were getting were kind of, they kind of fell into three categories, one of three. One, it was calling me some sort of phobia or ism. And like I said, those words lost their, their meaning pretty quickly to me. Two, it was some sort of personal attack, like you're ugly or like your hair extensions look bad. And I'm like, this is my real hair. Thank you, question mark. Or something to the effect of maybe you should have just trained harder, which is Hilarious. Keith Olbermann, right? That's like, someone eating Cheetos. Exactly. Yeah. And once you realize, once you realize there's no substance to anything these people are saying, right. really. Um, and, and understanding the profiles, because again, all of this is pretty much done through social media. I will tell you, other than protesters I've had like at campuses or events or something, like I've never once had someone in my day-to-day -day life come up to me and say something negative. But I've had thousands say something positive. So again, most of this is done through social media. What I've noticed about the profiles it's coming from, they don't have a profile picture right. a lot of time. They're scared to put their own face and name to it. Two, uh, they are someone who you can tell has never played a sport in their entire life and who has no grasp of, of the importance of playing sports and honestly, the importance of winning and succeeding in your sport. Um, and how hard that is and to how do. hard it is to do exactly yeah. once you once i realized this conglomerate of, of things i thought to myself gosh this speaks a whole lot more to their own insecurities than it does my own and now i have no problem reading these comments yeah, and, you're, and, you're, and so this is kind of interesting because you know you know kudos to her for being able to handle the comments but when it's the government, when it when it's a politician, you know, when it's the administration and you see a bunch of tweets that are just coming in like crazy battling people, you just go, oh, well, it's the government. That's that's who's that's who's handling those fake accounts, obviously. Right. Sometimes you'll be like maybe Russia, maybe China causing dissent. But when it comes to topics like this, because what she's describing is a fake account, probably some people, you know, who are spineless who want to have a burner account and say a bunch of horrible things. You know, as somebody who's a black Trump supporter, I receive it all the time, all the time on my posts. There's constantly people who are trying to get at me and you can tell that they're kind of not black because they can't speak. I know some, <laughs> I would say they can't speak proper English, but I don't mean they're speaking Ebonics. I mean, they're speaking like broken English. So I'm like, I don't know what this is. So I, I kind of ignore it. I'll block people, this, that, but but I just wonder who's doing it with her. Would it be administration? Would it be government still? Are they 
trying to push that agenda? I, I guess obviously they are because you're going to hear Riley talk about it. But it just makes me think why. Like I, I when I hear about you know LGBTQ and um, you know all these movements BLM and how they've been infiltrated, you know I can see that clearly. But I just don't get why. Like who would be pushing that? Would it be them? I don't know. I don't know. It's very very interesting. But what she's describing are pretty much fake accounts. Fake accounts. It's, it's just weird. But now she had to speak in front of Congress. I think this is so crazy. I think this is the greatest example of how upside down everything's become that a girl who just wants to be in a chain, her whole team, which I'm going to do some episodes on it. Her whole team was brainwashed and bullied into accepting this, but she was the one that stood up and she stood up the most. And it's just wild that she has to be an activist. You know, like I remember when I was 23 you're just, you're not you're an adult obviously but you're you're a young adult you don't need that type of thing thrusted on you and like kudos to her for standing up and handling it and, and just taking it you know and 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 not taking it and actually standing up to everything but it just seems so crazy that she has to be an activist about this whole thing check this out check how she handles this congresswoman let's go requires trans girls to take hormones for a year before they can play a sport so i waited for three years during that time i became self-conscious uncomfortable with my body and lost all of my confidence i was diagnosed with depression and anxiety i was finally approved to play on a girls team in the spring of my sophomore year of high school playing on a girls team has been an incredible experience for me I have made so many friends and improved so much despite starting, starting so late. My teammates treat me just like everyone else on the team. So do my coaches. My team is part of my family. We are all so different. In, in April of 2023, the Department of Education proposed a rule that, if adopted, would reverse this presumption. Under the proposed rule, women's sports aren't just for women. They're for anyone who simply says they are a woman. Unless a particular school can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the Department of Education that, can, that keeping a particular team female meets important educational objectives. The new rule mandates that every school in the country must demonstrate the unfairness of male participation on each specific women's team that they offer and develop rules that minimize harm to trans-identified athletes. But what about the harm to us? Who is working to minimize the harm done to female athletes? Let me be perfectly clear. A school that knowingly allows a male athlete to take a spot on a women's team or allows a male athlete to take the field in a women's game is denying a female student athletic opportunity. And that is sex-based discrimination and it violates Title IX, regardless of what the new regulations might say. It is my sincere hope that members of this committee, committee will take action to stop the Biden administration's illegal and administrative rewrite of Title IX. Of course, there is a place for everyone Regardless of gender identity, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of race or what sports you play, there's a place for everyone to play sports in this country. But unsafe, unfair, and discriminatory practices towards women must stop. Inclusion cannot be prioritized over safety and fairness. And Ranking Member Lee, if my tes testimony makes me transphobic, then I believe your opening monologue makes you a misogynist. Thank you. <laughs> Man, man. And she's saying that because that woman, that black lady that was talking, she's basically reading somebody else's experience, um, you know, getting onto a team uh, as a trans woman and how it made them feel and how great it is. And I love that she just I love that she's just standing up to it because this is what it takes. It takes a lot of being rigid and not a not being afraid to be being called, you know, mas not being able to be called, um, you know, transphobic racist, xenophobic, whatever, what have you. When you can stand up in the face of the woke mob and just say things like this, like like what everything she just said is just perfect common sense, perfect common sense. And if she was weaker minded, she could give in to the thought process that they're trying to throw onto her, that there's blood on her hands for what she's saying, that somehow what she's doing is actually killing people. Somehow what she's doing is 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 just so transphobic and she should just allow this to happen and she shouldn't be complaining and she's already privileged as a white Christian woman. It's all nonsense. And the more people stand up to this type of stuff, the better our society will be. So if you don't know by now, I would say definitely watch that episode. 
You know, she doesn't hold back whatsoever. She talks about the whole timeline about how she had to uh, accept Leia and, you know, tied with her and, you know, waking up to what was going on. So it's a great conversation. And, you know, Joe has a lot to say about this whole thing. He's been talking about it for years before it was even a prevalent thing in front of all of our faces, he was talking about it because of what was happening in the UFC. So I would definitely say, watch this episode. I don't know who's going to be on next. We're starting the week fresh. We'll see who it is. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Didn't Joe used to do five episodes a week? Am I wrong about that? If you're still watching, hit me up in the comments. Didn't he used to do five episodes a week? Now it's four, sometimes three. You know, uh, not complaining. Definitely not complaining. Just, I, I always thought it was five. Anyways, guys, check out those episodes. There's a link in the description if you want to hit them up on Spotify and you can find it all there. Other than that, I'm out.